DCS has no in-game benchmark, and as a consequence, there isn't a lot of good information on how various graphics cards perform with this game. In this video, I will be benchmarking 7 graphics cards that can be purchased for under $160. When I was working on my complete DCS setup for less than $500 video, I found that I was having a hard time quantifying performance with DCS. It is a tricky game to run smoothly. DCS is largely single thread and has aging code. It also features highly detailed 3D models, massive textures, and complicated physics. I set out to create a benchmarking mission that I could throw my collection of inexpensive graphics cards against. The mission I created uses the SU-25T and the Caucasus map, since these are included for free in DCS World. To generate a realistic CPU load, and also stress the GPU a bit more, I included many elements that are usually included in a typical DCS mission. These include other AI flights, active SAM batteries, large convoys of pathfinding ground units, and heavy AI on AI ground combat. There are large plumes of smoke and flames along the path your aircraft flies over. I also created a start benchmark and stop benchmark triggers along the flight path to alert me to stop the benchmarking software. In this case, MSI's Afterburner. Running the benchmark is as simple as popping into the mission, hitting A to activate autopilot, and following the messages. Also, when I realized I was seeing a significant CPU bottleneck when the visual settings were set low, I created another benchmarking mission that removes all other units from the map, reducing the CPU load significantly and shifting the focus of the benchmark more squarely onto the GPU. Each of the sub $200 graphics cards are run three times on each of these missions at three separate graphics settings. I chose 1080p resolution for this benchmark as it makes the most sense with the modest hardware that we are using. To keep things simple, I used the three default DCS graphics presets, low, medium, and high. As I didn't think it made much sense to run the medium preset without any anti-aliasing, I set MSAA to two times on all medium benchmarks. The GPUs I benchmark are as follows, NVIDIA's GTX 750Ti, AMD's Radeon R9 380 4GB, AMD's Radeon RX 480 8GB, NVIDIA's GTX 970, NVIDIA's GTX 980, AMD's Radeon RX 5500 XT 4GB, and NVIDIA's GTX 1650 Super. The test bench I used was built of parts that might find themselves in a very sensible budget build in 2020. I'm using AMD's Ryzen 5 1600AF clocked at 3.8GHz all cores. This processor, which comes in at $84, is likely the current price performance king in the new market. I'm using it with the Gigabyte B450M DS3H Micro ATX board. For memory, I'm running 32GB of Patriot DDR4 at 2666MHz. I know Ryzen would prefer faster memory, but it was the only DDR4 I had loose at the time. The boot drive and storage is handled by an Intel 500GB NVMe. In addition to the 7 graphics cards I already mentioned, I also ran my RTX 2080 Ti through the benchmarks as well. Here are the results. First up, we will take a look at the results from the Complex Mission benchmark at the lowest preset. It should be no surprise that the GTX 750 Ti, being the oldest and least powerful card in this lineup, should find itself at the bottom, with an average of 57.3 frames per second. The R9 380 fared significantly better, at 81.1 .1 frames per second. What happens next demonstrates what a significant CPU bottleneck DCS can create during moderately complicated missions. The remainder of the cards all perform within a few frames per second of each other. 110 frames per second seemed to be the limit of how fast our 1600 AF was going to let these cards perform on this mission. The 2080 Ti, which is a full $1,000 more expensive than anything else in this competition, didn't even top the charts. Again, this is due to the solid CPU bottleneck the more powerful cards hit. Still, the results fall within an expected margin of error. The medium preset during the complex mission benchmark showed more of the same. The aging GTX 750Ti still delivered a playable result at 43.2 frames per second, as did the R9 380 at 59.3 frames per second. 
considering that we now have anti-aliasing turned on, these results aren't bad for cards that can be found for well below $100. The RX 480 still performs smoothly at an average of 86.2 frames per second, but as you can see from the rest of the results, the RX 480 was now finding itself the limiting factor for frames. The remainder of the cards all hovered around 100 frames per second. As the GTX 970 is nearly 6 years old and was a mid-tier card even when released, the fact that it is coming within a few frames of the monstrous RTX 2080 Ti shows that we, again, are hitting a CPU bottleneck. The results from the complex mission benchmark with the high preset are where we start to see this tier of graphics cards really sweat. The GTX 750 Ti with its 2GB of VRAM is no longer a viable option and chugs along at 18.5 frames per second. Likewise, the R9 380 delivers an unplayable 20.6 frames per second. The RX 480, despite having twice the VRAM as every other cheap card in the competition, ekes out just 32.5 frames per second. The GTX 970, although being older than the RX 480, edges it out with a comfortable 39.1 frames per second, which is definitely passable for a flight simulator. The RX 5500 XT and GTX 1650 Super score within a couple frames per second of each other at 42 and 44 frames per second respectively. The GTX 980, even at 6 years old, demonstrates that it was once a high-end card and comfortably outperforms the rest of the sub-$200 cards at 46.9 frames per second. The RTX 2080 Ti finally pulls its weight. This benchmark at these high graphics settings will consume 5.7GB of VRAM if allowed, which is why the delta is so huge between the 11GB RTX 2080 Ti and the rest of the cards. Once we removed a lot of the CPU load, we were able to confirm a lot of what we already suspected from the previous results. During the empty mission benchmark at the low preset settings, we saw the GTX 750 Ti and R9 perform nearly identically to how they did during the complex mission. Note, however, that the 1% and 0.1% lows are far tighter during this low complexity mission. The RX 480, likewise, performed only a few frames per second higher in this benchmark, topping out at 120.3 frames per second. The remainder of the cards all performed above 140 FPS, and it appears that the CPU limit is now 150 frames per second as that is where we see both the RTX 2080 Ti and GTX 1650 Super hit their walls. The empty mission benchmark with medium settings again showed that the GTX 750 Ti, R9 380, and RX 480 are proving to be the bottleneck when the CPU load is lessened, each coming within a few FPS of where they were during their complex mission benchmark. We finally started to see some performance differences from the remaining cards, with the RX 5500 XT and GTX 970 performing nearly identically at around 103 frames per second. The GTX 980 performed 9% better than its contemporary, the GTX 970, delivering 112.2 frames per second. Considering how closely the two cards tend to benchmark together in reviews I have read, I was surprised to see the 1650 Super command a 13.5% lead over its primary market competition, the RX 5500 XT. 116 frames per second on average with 1% and 0.1% lows above 90 frames per second is an excellent result. The RTX 2080 Ti only took a 14 FPS hit over the low preset and came in with 136 frames per second average. The empty mission benchmark with the high preset showed no appreciable change for the GTX 750 Ti, R9 380, RX 480, GTX 970, RX 5500 XT, and GTX 1650 Super over the complex mission benchmark. However, the GTX 980 again showed its potential at these higher graphical settings with a 6.2% increase over its previous result at 50 frames per second. The RTX 2080 Ti, again not being limited by VRAM, doubled the GTX 980's performance with a result of 105 frames per second. The next chart demonstrates the deltas I observed between the complex and empty mission benchmarks over the three graphical presets. As is clear, the GTX 750 Ti and R9 380 never found themselves limited by CPU overhead. The RX 5500 XT, RX 480, and GTX 970 showed significant CPU bottlenecking at the low preset, minor at medium, and none at high. The GTX 980 saw moderate CPU bottlenecking throughout all three presets. Given the age of this card and how inexpensive you can find them nowadays, I was impressed with these results. The RTX 2080 Ti showed an approximately 24% delta due to the CPU constraints during these tests. This is probably a good takeaway from these tests. Depending on the complexity of the mission you are flying, expect up to a 25% hit in performance depending on your CPU. The GTX 1650 Super proved impressive throughout the test, only finally becoming the limiting factor to performance in the high preset. Since much of this video has been spent discussing CPU bottleneck, 
How much of a performance increase would you expect to see if you had a beefier processor? My primary gaming computer runs an i7-8700K overclocked to 5 GHz on all cores. After running the complex benchmark on high, I saw a nearly 20% increase when compared with the Ryzen 1600 AF. Since the 8700K costs nearly four times as much as the 1600 AF, it again demonstrates what incredible value the Ryzen CPU is. Conclusion time. Despite how well much of the used hardware in this comparison test performed, I think it would be hard to overlook the GTX 1650 Super in this price bracket. Better driver support, DDR6 memory, cutting edge NVENC streaming encoding, wide availability and efficient power usage are all strong selling points to this entry level card. The fact that it often bests performance from the GTX 980, an aging but still very capable once high end card, shows how much value there is in the GTX 1650 Super. On the GTX 980, I wouldn't hesitate to recommend this card to someone if you can find one in good shape for around $9110. There is still a lot of life left in this Maxwell family card. This Zotac third party card I found on eBay is particularly cool with a beefy metal fan surround and backplate. Between the GTX 980 and 1650 Super, however, the 1650 Super offers a lot of modern nice-to-haves for the extra $30 to $50 you will spend on it. The aforementioned NVENC encoder will allow you to record your gameplay without any appreciable performance hit, and the 1650 Super has a TDP of only 100 watts compared to the 165 watts of the 980. Further, many of the 1650 Super cards I have seen have super small form factors that easily fit in many ITX cases with room to spare. If you already have a GTX 970 or even an RX 480 and are content to play at 1080p, then there probably isn't a reason to upgrade quite yet. However, if you are moving from an older card or just looking to build a budget system while you wait at the NVIDIA 3000 series and whatever AMD has coming up next, then I can confidently recommend the GTX 1650 Super. A few more things. The version of DCS I used for these benchmarks was Open Beta 2.5.6.47404. Currently, open beta has been the subject of a lot of criticism regarding performance, so I expect that future revisions will hopefully see performance increases across the board. Also, I used Display Driver Uninstaller when swapping graphics cards and deleted all FXO and meta shaders between tests. If you would like to try this benchmark on your own system, I will include the link to the download once EcoDynamics approves the file. Thanks for watching, and please subscribe if you are interested in more DCS and hardware related content.